over to you, Jen. Thanks, Reggie. All right, hello everyone, and uh, and welcome to this talk. Um, welcome also to Ben, who has just joined the department as a new lecturer. Um, I guess uh, a, month, a month ago, yeah, I started Ben. Um, so it's it's uh, with great delight that I introduce him. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of information about Ben's background. Um, so I think we have a lot of our own students here. So um, some of our students may be familiar with some of Ben's work, but we've got new students um, as well as members of the public, of course. So um, so Ben um, has a, a background with a, an interest in in uh, animals and prehistory. I guess we'll kind of summarize some of that. But Ben also dabbles with with sound. Um, I've known him for a very long time, so I think you must have been an undergrad at York, Ben, when I was doing my PhD, <laughs> and you were really interested in um, in how people were interacting with animals in the early prehis prehistory um, through sort of the lens of Star Car. And I remember you gave a talk about beavers, which was really interesting. Anyway, that's that's a long time ago. So um, Ben has gone to a variety of different um, places. So you've been in, in Dublin um, fairly recently. You've just come from Newcastle. Uh, I think Lester has been on the, the list as well. Um, and and then you were at York for quite a while so that you've moved around. You're, you've got a really good sort of network of, of people who you've worked with. Um, so uh, Ben's done a lot of work in, in early prehistory, a lot of work with um, how people are interacting with animals, but also like, looking at things that that me as a sort of traditional zoo archaeologist that I wouldn't really think of. So using sound as well and thinking about how sound works in the past. Um, so Ben's going to be uh, teaching on a, a wide variety of our modules. So I hope all of our students will get a chance to, to meet Ben. And um, of course, we have talked about some of his work um, in the context of um, of star car and antler frontlets. Uh, I certainly use those examples in my own teaching. So you may have come across Ben that way. Um, so I think I'll hand over to Ben in just a second, but before I do, I want to mention um, a showcase session we are running next Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. I think it's between three and five where we're doing a, a session where um, it's basically what we all did in, during the summer. So it's, it's like um, excavations, post -ex, um archival research, anything like that. Um, we're gonna get, um, everyone to just kind of do a little 10 minute talk about their own research projects. So um, look out in your inbox for an invite to that session. Um, so, okay, I think that's um, everything I need to say now. So Ben, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, I, before I start, just two kind of disclaimers. Um, I'm gonna be reading from a script today. I don't normally do that, but uh, when I'm presenting online and you don't have a sense of an audience grinding its teeth or tapping its watch, um, it's, it's a bit easier for me to stay on track. So uh, I'll be reading from the script and because of that, I can tell you that I'll be talking for 45 minutes there or thereabouts, unless something terrible goes goes wrong. Um, let me just share my screen, my PowerPoint presentation. Share. Go. Screen. Cracking. Okay. so. Um, Many thanks for inviting me to speak as part of this series and give me an opportunity to introduce my work to a new set of colleagues, students and neighbours here at UHI. I'm going to talk to you all about a research project that I've been involved with since October 2019, and although it was due to finish next month, it's been extended due to the disruption caused by the pandemic. It's called Masks and Mask, and it's led by Chantelle Canella. But up until last month, it was based solely at Newcastle University. Masks and Mask is funded by the Leverhulme Trust. The project focuses on the archaeology of masks and masking practices within prehistoric European hunter-gatherer groups. I'll warn you at the outset, this project deals with a funerary record, so there'll be some, the presentation will feature some images of, of human remains. Essentially, today I'll be filling you in on the, the hot mess that is the current thinking on masks in the Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic of Europe, and very quickly show you why this has to date been fundamentally flawed, in my opinion. Uh, I'm then going to outline, uh, outline the approach that our project will be taking to this material and the ways in which we are critically reappraising the evidence for masks in a manner that aims to generate new insights and understandings concerning attitudes towards the head and material ontologies within prehistoric societies. This project takes a risk. We genuinely did not know at the outset if there is a grand na narrative concerning masks and faces hidden within the early prehistoric record of Europe. However, our approach is designed to enrich our understanding of these periods in several different ways regardless of whether specific masking practices emerge from our research. I'll hopefully be able to show you what I mean with some edited highlights of one of our case studies, the use of amber and clay in burial practices of the 4th millennium um, BC Eastern Baltic. When they appear within the archaeological record, masks leave a mark. As images, scholars find masks deeply arresting, stopping us in our tracks and allowing us to glimpse the long forgotten faces of the people we chase through our work. 
Masks force us to consider the opposition of self and another, the role of performance, and the capacity for dramatic deceit within the societies we study. However, these questions stem from a set of cultural preconceptions over what masks are, when they're worn, and what they can do. The anthropological record is jam-packed with alternatives to our preconceptions in Northwest Europe. And as we have witnessed in the past 18 months, global attitudes towards masks and masking are transforming in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Masks play a recurrent but low key role in the interpretation of Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic archaeology. And this is perhaps best captured by a conference on masking, which was held at the Sala Museum of Prehistory in 2009 and is subsequently published in a volume edited by Harold Meller in 2010. Harold Meller, young Hans Jurgen Mullerbeck, Nicola Mellard, Konstantin Rauer, and Harold Floss contribute a series of six papers within this that deal with the origins of masking practices in early prehistoric Europe. These draw primarily from the Paleolithic parietal mobiliary art, with an added sprinkling of red deer headdresses added for good measure. When considered holistically, there's a broad narrative or deep history of masks that emerges from these papers, structured around the classic early prehistoric sequence of cultural change. This begins in the Arab nation, with the initial arrival of Homo sapiens sapiens into Europe. Consistent depictions of human-animal hybrids featuring animal heads on human bodies is pointed to as evidence for mask use in transformation rituals. High profile examples include the ochre depictions of masked stick men from Grotta de Fumare, the lion men of the Swabian Alb, and the general observation that you don't get animal bodies with human heads depicted in the Arab nation material. This is used to argue for spirituality, even religion, within the earliest groups of our own species in Europe. However, this argument is somewhat fuzzy on the details of these belief systems and fails to explain the anthropomorphic human depictions with human shaped heads, such as the Frines from Glossenkloster and Stratzing. What might the suspension and possibly changeable head of the Hong Fells figurine signify in relation to masks and mask wearing? Moving forward into the middle upper Paleolithic, the Gravettian, Pavlovian, Willendorf, Kostenki, and Avido complexes are increasingly treated collectively. They are argued to share commonalities in their reticence to provide facial details on anthropomorphic figurines, leading to suggestions that faces were either taboo or unimportant within these contexts. Consistencies in the placing of beads and ochre around the head and burials, originally noted by Musi, is also argued to represent the emergence of death masking practices, again designed to conceal the face of the deceased. And yet, we have examples of anthropomorphic figurines with high levels of human facial details depicted, such as at Brasson III, Donny Vestenis, and Grotte de Prince. We have depictions of just faces at Donny Vestenis and Barma Grande. And you might note that the, only, the one area of the head not covered by beads in Musi's schematic diagrams of mortuary ritual is the face. Arguments for masking practices in the Magdalenian take a bit of a turn, balancing the depiction of animal faced humanoids in cave art with the detailed naturalistic facial portraits from the engraved plaquettes at sites like the marsh. The argument proposed by Rauer is that this duality reflects taboos concerning the killing and eating of sentient animals and the donning and doffing of masks in order to facilitate human animal transformations and negotiate permission for these acts. However, this argument does little to explain the apparent aversion towards the detailed depiction of female faces or the spatial discretion of these practices noted by Fuertes et al. in their 2017 study of Magdalenian symbolic expression. The proposed dichotomy is also further eroded by the occurrence of semi-detailed human faces at Marsoulos. We also see hints of a broader cultural interest in human heads in the intentional working of human crania at Goss Cave, Isteritz and Lipacar during the Magdalenian, that this argument does little to address. Finally, as we move into the Holocene, attention falls onto the modified red deer crania from Starkar in northern Germany. These are cited as, as a continuation of pre-existing traditions of, mas of masking, albeit the earliest incidents of actual masks themselves surviving within the archaeological record. Masking practices from the Magdalenian are simply adapted to the change in prey brought about by the advent of Holocene ecologies. Yet this theory does little to address the apparent regionalization of this practice, with red deer crania being modified red deer crania being restricted to, to Britain and northern Germany, nor the specific ways these artifacts fitted into their contemporary material culture. Floss, Rauer, Mellard, Mullerbeck, and Mellard himself all cite the anthrop anthropological evidence for masks within all traditional societies, alongside the poor chances of artifact survival, to basically argue that masks must be in the Paleolithic, regardless of whether we can see them or not. 
Therefore, anything vaguely masky depicted within the Paleolithic cave or mobility art is presumed by these authors to be a mask. Something's going on here with my PowerPoint, not entirely sure, but there's um, some words there that I will go over anyway, so don't worry too, too much about it. <laughs> However, these references to the anthropology of masks are vague at best. A more detailed reading of the literature concerning masks has identified numerous instances of indigenous groups who do not make or wear masks, such as the Nascapi of, Eastern, of the Eastern Canadian subarctic. Perhaps some of the archaeological confusion here stems from the huge influence of Levi Strauss's 1973 book, The Ways of the Mask. Levi Strauss argue, uses ethnographic research into First Nations mask making practices in British Columbia to build a structuralist argument that links mythology and art form. Much of Levi Strauss's thinking and its development by subsequent researchers hinges on concepts of universality. However, the critical thrust of Levi Strauss's argument is not that masks and mask making are universal in all human cultures, but that the relationship between visual culture and mythology is. Oh, there we go. That's not to say that anthropological approaches to masks have, no, have nothing to offer in these debates. When developing interpretations of the star car red deer frontlets, I began to use the term mask rather than headdress to refer to these objects because it opened up the potential to draw from a rich vein of anthropological studies into performance, identity and ontology carried out in relation to societies across the world. Anthropologists tend to use the term, tend to use the term mask rather than headdress and draw little in the way of technical distinction between the two. So I began to think of the Starcar artifacts as masks without any real evidence that these were worn directly across the face. From an anthropological perspective, they simply don't need to in order to be classified as a mask. A further strand of discussion relates to the burial record with specific mortuary practices that involve the covering of the face, the death mask. The often cited examples of this include Grave One from the Congamos levels at Tagalog, where the facial bones of an entombed adult female were found coated in red ochre, or the Middle Neolithic burials of Nyeki, some of which feature heads covered in clay and amber rings set over the eyes. Taken collectively, these research narratives struggle with a similar set of themes. There is recurrent difficulty in categorically identifying masks within the archaeological record. Is the famous lion man of Holmstadel a depiction of a human animal hybrid being or a human wearing a mask? Attempts to identify signs of binding or clasps around the face of the lion man have so far proven futile. Similarly, arguments that la dame la capuche must be a depiction of a mask because of the absence of a mouth feel somewhat flimsy. After all, she also lacks shoulders and a body. There are also problems in distinguishing between normative and non-normative behaviours in these studies. If masks are present, when and where are they worn and by whom? The often differentially, differentially fragmented character of the early prehistoric record makes answers to these questions difficult to come by. As you can see, the current thinking on masks and masking practices in Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic Europe is, to put it mildly, in a bit of a mess. There may well be something interesting going on with masks in early prehistoric Europe, but if there is, the work carried out to date hasn't quite got to grips with it. With masks and masks, we've been attempting to impose some kind of order onto this chaos and avoid a few of the pitfalls that have inhibited previous research. It's abundantly clear from the, from the literature that in order to overcome the challenges I've outlined, any attempt to argue convincingly for evidence of prehistoric masks needs to take a contextual approach. We've chosen to conceptualise this by placing a focus on two particular strands of prehistoric practice, depicting the human face and dressing the human head. Developing an understanding of these two areas of practice allows us to construct more nuanced and historically situated arguments for the presence or absence of masks within the archaeological record. By studying the way in which human faces are depicted and heads dressed, we aim to define the areas of overlap, the instance where material embellishment and understandings of the face combine. Bringing together an understanding of these two areas of practice creates opportunities to think about the materials and form of masks with more specificity. An initial step towards addressing this, um, as an initial step towards addressing this, our project has been developing a catalogue of evidence for the depiction of human faces and the dressing of human heads from across the Pleistocene and Holocene hunter-gatherer groups of Europe. The former draws, draws primarily from the parietal and mobility art, and the latter from material culture and the burial record, although there is some overlap between the two. The catalogue aims to be comprehensive and will form the backbone of a chronologically sequenced understanding of these practices and foundational context for any discussions of masks and masking practices. We also have a number of case studies, specific times and places within the prehistoric world where we can explore the archaeological context in a little more detail, ask specific questions of key data sets, 
and begin to generate more nuanced insights into hunter-gatherer material ontologies through the study of masks. The first of these chronologically is the Pavlovian, the middle upper Paleolithic of Moravia in the Czech Republic. Here, we've been looking to explore in detail the difference between the ways in which human and animal faces are depicted within a set tradition of visual material culture. This will create a detailed record of the ways in which animal heads and anthropomorphic heads are represented and, and depicted, and link this to previous work undertaken by Dr. Becky Farbstein on specific manufacturing techniques. Previous research has alluded to a greater attention to detail in the depiction of animal faces than human faces in the, in, in the Pavlovian. But, this, but does this hold out beyond the oft-published images of show-stopping artifacts? Is the presence or absence of facial detail more a product of heads themselves not being represented within these figurines? The data we generate will be contextualized within the broader Pavlovian record, which features anthropomorphic engravings and ochre and beads applied to the heads and faces within burials. This analysis was on the cusp of happening last August, but the second wave of COVID meant an indefinite pause for this work. We're hoping to get back over there next summer. The second case study will look in detail at the anthropologically modified animal skulls from the early Holocene of Northwest Europe. Originally, we'd hoped to build from my analysis of the latest finds from Star Car and assess a number of other potential candidates for work animal skulls from the Vale of Pickering, the Kennet Valley and Denmark. We had also hoped to study the well-documented examples from northern Germany to see how these compare technologically and zooarchaeologically with the Starkar artefacts. This case study has been more heavily disrupted by COVID and has also been spiced up considerably by a recent critique of our Starkar analysis from colleagues in Germany. This critique frames a number of new research questions for this material on both sides of the North Sea, and it may well be worth reviewing these collectively when the opportunity to pursue this finally does arrive. The final case study involves the mid-Holocene hunter-gatherer cemetery site of the Baltic region and will be the work that I'm going to speak to you about in more detail today. This again has been restructured due to the pandemic and in its revised form has consisted of an in-depth review of the published literature on these sites. The catalogue and case studies will feed into a final project monograph which provides an account of facial depiction and headdressing within the Pleistocene and Holocene hunter-gatherer groups of Europe. From this narrative, specific mask making and mask wearing practices will be drawn out to shed light on material ontologies and personhood within these day age societies. The case study that has taken up most of my time over the course of the past, of the, of the course of the project to date is the study of he headdressing practices in the mid Holocene Baltic region and the material ontologies which underlie them. This has involved asking new questions of previously published literature and data, and I would like to say now that it would not have been possible without the fantastic support of colleagues from across Europe who've been furnishing me with grey literature, scans of printed publications, PDFs, PhD chapters and translation chips, uh, tips. I'm going to show you how all of this works in just a tick, but first let me take a moment to explain why I think prehistoric material ontologies and Baltic archaeology is of relevance within the context of UHI's Archaeology Institute because this might not seem self-evident at first glance. It will become obvious that I find both of these things fascinating and exciting, but that in and of itself might not pass muster around these parts. Firstly then, the Baltic. Superficially, the Baltic and the North Sea, the study of which UHI enjoys a strong reputation in, share a lot in common. They're both marginal areas of the Atlantic situated along similar latitudes and flanked by coastal areas with deep histories of human occupation. They're physically linked through the Katagath and Danish Straits, However, these two bodies of water have dramatically differing human histories, particularly during the early and mid Holocene. Contrasts in the interaction between farming and fisher hunter gathering around the bodies of water are particularly stark, with the latter remaining dominant throughout the various phases of the Baltic's Neolithics until the arrival of corded ware ceramics in the region at around 2800 Cal BC. There appears to be a behavioural commonality and a degree of openness to the sharing of ideas across prehistoric communities of the Baltic that's never quite matched by those of the North Sea. It's worth noting that whilst the histories of research in both areas are very different, even the impact of the Iron Curtain did little to dispel these pan-Baltic similarities. I find the Baltic a really useful foil to our archaeological understanding of the North Sea and a springboard for asking but why questions of received wisdom relating to the role of the North Sea plays in connecting or dividing people in the past. If the Baltic Sea appears to have facilitated the spread of ceramic technologies between hunter-gatherer groups, why didn't the North Sea? If the population density of hunter-gatherer groups is so consistently dense around the coastline of the Baltic, why does it appear so variable around that of the North Sea? 
Learning about the prehistory of the Baltic will help you rethink the prehistory of the North Sea. It might, might well help you to reappraise the role of the North Sea in more recent periods too. Secondly, material ontologies. I should start off here by explaining when I use the word ontology, I'm referring to the taken for granted mechanisms by which the world works. The largely non-discursive assumptions that a social group share that explain how the world around them operates. These vary between different people in different times and in different places. Understanding ontologies has been a focus for anthropologists for many, many years. However, the study of ontologies has been dramatically shaken up by the word of Eduardo, work of Eduardo Viveres de Castro in the early noughties. Viveres de Castro delivered a withering critique of the colonial underpinnings of anthropological practice in regards to ontology in his famous research into the Amer Amerindian groups of South and Central America. He argued that the tendency of anthropologists to treat indigenous ontologies as misrepresentations of reality were unproductive and fundamentally rooted within notions of Western superiority. Instead of trying to identify the trick or the misunderstanding of reality that caused the development and maintenance of different ontologies, anthropologies, according to Rios de Castro, should instead accept that they are experiencing a different reality, are living in a world where things work differently. This leaves researchers free to focus on the implications of those different ontologies and explore what else might be possible within these worlds. His most famous example is that of the shamans who transform themselves into jaguars within the Merindian ontologies. Viverius de Castro contends that these transformations are not a metaphor, neither do they represent a deception or willing suspension of disbelief on the part of the audience. The shaman really does transform their body into that of a jaguar. He calls on anthropologists to accept these transformations as a reality within the Merindian ontologies and to focus their research on exploring the implications of this for the mechanics of these worlds and their relationship to that of the world of the, world of the research of themselves. Increasingly, archaeologists following the broader ontological term within anthropology have sought to explore past ontologies through the ways in which people engage with material culture, animals, plants, landscapes and each other, and acknowledging the different worlds in which past Past people inhabited and how these worlds interacted with those of their contemporaries, they draw attention to the historically, historical specificity of our own ontologies. Chantal Canella and Yvonne Marshall have been at the forefront of this wave of interest, which has slowly been taken up by a broader cadre of researchers over the course of the past two decades. In the context of our own horrendously unsustainable attitudes towards the material world and their dire environmental consequences, exploring alternative material ontologies is a timely and worthwhile endeavour. Reconsidering how our, our assumptions of what materials can be, when they are working, when they're broken, how they can be mixed together and how, can they be, and how they might be separated apart, is a good thing to be doing in 2021. Ooh, go back one. However, I would argue that we can go further than this and that teaching degree students about different ontologies can go some way towards helping us to face the social challenges of life in the post-truth era. I consider myself to be fairly liberal and usually operate on an if you're not hurting anyone, live and let live approach when it comes to dealing with other human beings. Yet since 2016, I've increasingly found myself having conversations with friends, family and colleagues about subjects that I struggle to agree to disagree on. Within these conversations, attempts to educate or enlighten opposing parties are routinely rejected, in part because of the assumption of ignorance or stupidity that those attempts inevitably imply. The tension can often be insurmountable and forms a roadblock for any productive or open-minded discourse between, between entire segments of our society. I've sometimes found it useful to reframe these conversations by thinking of these divisions as fractured ontologies within our own societies. Taking an ontological approach to the seemingly fundamental divisions that run through our contemporary political discourse has a potential to shift the emphasis of discussion away from who is right and who is wrong, who is ignorant and who is enlightened, who is clever and who is stupid, and refocus on the areas of overlap between coexisting realities, the key shared ontological concepts that can affect change in multiple realities. This approach is not uncontroversial, in, uncontroversial and the extended critique of the ontological term with anthropology is littered with cautionary tales concerning the intellectual consequences of this mode of thought. However, giving students an understanding of what ontologies are, how they differ, and the various critiques of their analysis is potentially a key skill, not a panacea or a magic bullet by any means, but another useful tool in the shed for navigating the divided political landscape of 2021 and affecting change within incongru incongruent fractions of society. All right, I'll get on the soapbox now and move on to the case study. It's been decades since Marit Velabel pointed out that the hunter-gatherer communities of the Baltic region share much in the way of cosmology and technology during the mid-Holocene. He noted that local differences in the way in which Mesolithic and Neolithic are defined have often disguised the fact that this area is predominantly populated by hunter-gatherers until 2800 KBC. 
The riparian and lacustrine landscapes, which drains the Baltic itself, provide both ecological homogeneity and networks of movement and communication for seemingly disparate groups. This case study follows Bellabil's lead and takes the mid Holocene Baltic region as a unit of analysis. Within this setting, we see the emergence of sites with multiple inhumations. I'm defining cemetery sites as having more than three burials here. This provides us a rare opportunity to study headdressing and in mortuary practices in context. Unlike single inhumation sites, they offer a chance to consider more normative and non normative behaviour in relation to the treatment of the head. Cemetery sites are found on, on the both on both the north and south coast of the Baltic, in the east and in the west. I've marked them on the map here, and they include Zvenjeki, uh, the Skatterholm and Vedbeck sites, Donkarnis, Grosfedervald, Spignas, Tagorup, Strangwagen, Olegostrovsky, Kolmhammer, Pispa, Dudka, Tamula, and Hadaka. Some of these hunter-gatherer cemeteries are huge, containing hundreds of burials. Others are much smaller. Some are in use for thousands of years, some for a matter of decades. Size and longevity do not correlate in the way you might expect in the Baltic. I've been looking at the treatment of the head in these burials, collecting data on the, on the types of artifacts deposited on and around the head through published drawings and grave inventories. I've now done this for over 600 burials, and it's providing evidence for a rich patchwork of mortuary practices involving the dressing of the head, which vary in terms of spatial and temporal distribution. What are these practices? Well, there's a lot going on. I'll start with the use of ochre in adorning the head and surrounding areas of the grave, which is widespread in terms of both time and space across the region. This shouldn't come as used in itself. Judith Grunberg has noted that ochre within burials is a recurrent theme throughout early prehistory at the global scale. However, we can see a few distinct practices emerging across the Baltic that seem to relate specifically to the head. We see ochre mixed uniformly into the grave fill itself, often in layers upon which the body has been placed. This seems to form part of a wider tradition of using colour within the grave fill deposits, with the use of white minerals at Peshanita and intentionally gathered dark earth at Zvenjeki. The frequency of these practices seems to be site specific, featuring over 90% of the burials at Oleostrovsky and Don Carmis, but forming a much smaller minority at the Bedbeck sites. In some instances, we see ochre forming part of distributions which extend over discrete portions of the grave. We might think of these as organic clothing or coverings, which have been dyed with ochre and extended across the head. Six individuals at Vedbeck and 53 individuals at Svenjeki feature this form of patterning in ochre distribution. Occasionally, ochre appears to have been applied more directly to the body, with ochre distributions that follow the form of the human remains themselves. The most striking example of this is the formation of Tagorot 1 burial, where ochre appears to have been applied directly to the face of the deceased. More commonly, we see discrete distributions of ochre which extend from the surface of the cranium into the surrounding areas of the, of the grave fill. This occurs on 20 individuals distributed across the Zvedbeck and Zvenjeki cemeteries. This may result from the dyeing of, of, the dyeing of the hair with powdered ochre prior to burial, the distribution of the ochre demarking the dyed hair. Further evidence for the styling of hair within graves comes from the presence of bone pins and animal tooth pendants, which are found within these ochre distributions. Examples of this, occurred at Gunnarshai and Zvedjeki. We see multiple instances of animal tooth pendants being placed in relation to the head, and there are clear patterns within this. Garina has argued for the presence of crested hoods at Oleostrovsky, indicated by linear arrangements of pendants which extend longitudinally across the cranium. These are noted on Burial 60, and similar arrangements can be observed at Zvedjeki, Burial 146 and Burial 160. A more common pattern is that of a latitudinal linear arrangement of animal tooth pendants, and these can be seen right across the region. I've been tentatively thinking of these as feronias, strung around the circumference of the head. Examples of these can be found at Oli Ostrovsky, Zvenjeki, Grosfedeveld, Dudka, and possibly Tamula. And perhaps the most iconic example occurs at Don Carlos. Another pattern that we see is the placement of objects over the sense organs, the eyes, the mouth, the nose, and the ears. Again, Dolcarnis II is an exceptional example where elk incisors have been placed in the nostrils and wild boar teeth in the mouth, in the ears, and over the eyes. Oliostrovsky also has examples of, indiv of individuals with beaver and elk incisors placed in the nostrils and over the eyes, and a flint blade in the mouth. Dudka has an individual with a stone placed in the right ear. Zvenjeki has a burial with two pebbles placed over the eyes. Chronologically, the placement of animal teeth over the sense organs seems to be focused in the centuries around 5000 Cal BC. We also see site-specific practices relating to the head. 
At Oleostrovsky, we see a practice of bringing together little clusters of material culture within graves, consisting of bayer canines, slate knives, and occasionally other animal tooth pendants. More often than not, these are placed around the head with a particular prevalence of placement next to the top of the cranium. Almost all the slate knives featuring feature some form of small perforation, and the bear canines have been worked to an alloy suspension, suggesting that these items may have been strung or bound together. I'm beginning to think of these as bundles. A quick side note here, um, slate and shale are often used interchangeably within the archaeological literature, and for the sake of consistency, I'll, I'll use slate in this presentation. Um, bundling is a concept that's received a lot of attention within theoretical circles over the past decade. Indigenous scholarship on bundling in the Midwest of the United States has been held up as a non-Western alternative to route, alternative route to the assemblage thinking of European scholars. Much of this work is acutely historically specific, dealing with the implications that bundling concepts have for the trauma of colonial settlement, museum acquisitions, public display, and ultimately the complications this creates for repatriation. However, there is a strand of anthropology on bundling which traces these practices across North, Central and South America and draws some cross-cultural observations which might be of use here. Working on the broader scale, Carlson notes that bundling practices fall into three systems, personal, medicine and ceremonial. Ceremonial bund bundles are communal collections of objects which are opened, altered or deposited on very sacred occasions. The frequency, the frequency that we see the bare canine, slate canine plus band bundles occurring within the graves of Olmostrovsky and the consistency in their content suggests that they're not best thought of as ceremonial bundles. Personal bundles tend to belong to individuals and most likely to feature within individual funerary ceremonies. Objects are added to personal bundles at significant points in an individual's life, and as such, these collections become biographically intertwined with the person themselves. Finally, medicine bundles are often collected in response to or preparation for a specific historic event. This might be a particular social occasion, the birth of a child, an illness, a little weather event, the list is almost endless. I'm still working through the literature and implication for these ideas, but I think bundling might be a useful way to conceptualise these clusters of material culture and their placement in relation to the head needs to be taken into consideration when drawing any conclusions. If they are bundles, they're bundles that also include um, the human head. The final two practices here, the covering of the head in clay and the placement of amber on and around the head, are what I want to drill down into a little more detail now. I want to think about these practices in relation to the materials involved and what they might be telling us about material ontologies at a specific point in time and space. What we're looking at here is a small number of individuals who have their heads covered in clay with pieces of amber worked to varying degrees set within that clay. We see this in six burials at Zvenyeki in Latvia, and seven more at Komhama, Hartika, Bantarata, and Pispa in Finland. The face is covered in clay, fragments of clay from the Finnish sites feature impressions of eyebrows and moustaches, and these appear as very strong contenders for classification as masks. Here we have a um, clear instance of a specific attention being paid to covering a human face with material culture. In some instances, amber has been placed over the eyes, producing these really striking images and prompting sticks-like interpretations of tokens for the afterlife. However, interpreting these practices has proven far from straightforward due to their variability. The general lack of bone preservation at the finished sites makes it difficult to ascertain with certainty the parts of the skull to which clay was applied. Whilst the amber over the eyes imagery is evocative, amber can be placed around the head and amber artefacts come in a range of forms, including rings, discs, buttons and amulets. This variability makes the interpretation of burials which include amber artifacts around the head but lack evidence for clay difficult. We see this at Kangasa and Kavana, where the relationship between specific burials and this broader masking tradition is ambiguous. In some, but not all cases, ochre has been used to stain the clay. Maya Ahola's doctoral research has demonstrated that some examples come from cemeteries, some come from cemeteries and settlement sites, and some come from individual graves and settlement sites. So there's variation in the context in which they're appearing. The affinities between the Finnish examples and the typical Comeware period have long been documented and a broad congruence between these dates and those of Zvenyeki acknowledged. However, recent advances in, in a range of dating techniques now allow us to examine the chronology of this practice in more detail. Medowatao's extensive research at Zvenyeki allows us to correct previously collected AMS dates for the local marine reservoir effects and situate these dates within a Latvian Middle Neolithic chronological framework. These can be compared with the much refined dates for the typical Comeware period produced by Persson and Oinen. These comparisons indicate that the earliest appearance of the practice in both Latvia and Finland are congruous, 
although these are not necessarily linked to the, appear the initial appearance of the typical coma period. These practices also appear to persist for longer at Zvenyeki than they do in Finland, potentially even extending into the corded wear phase of the cemetery's use. So how can we interpret this? What might these practices be telling us about material ontologies of these past undergoer societies? If we refer to the anthropological literature on masks, we can argue that masks in non-Western societies play less of a role in disguise and concealment than they do within the theatrical traditions of modern Europe. Pisano argues that sometimes non-Western masks are something to be looked into or looked through, and as such form a lens between distinct cosmological worlds. A specific example of this comes from Finnick Royland's work with the Yupik mask of the late 20th century Western Alaska through interviews with the acclaimed mask maker Nick Charles. Taking this approach places a specific focus on the material choices involved in the making of the mask itself. We are forced to ask what materials might be required to see between worlds. This question presents an opportunity to consider the position of specific materials within past ontologies. Archaeologies of effect, drawing from the work of Spinoza, Bennett, Rivera's de Castro, Deleuze and Latour, can help us to move beyond our own historically specific material ontologies when it comes to considering best societies in the past. Over the last two decades, Chantal Canoe's work has exemplified this approach by considering the properties or effects of specific materials and exploring their relationship between these in discussions with extent which extend beyond the conventional Western categories of materials which under, underpin our own worldview. So how might we apply this to the Middle Neolithic death mass of the Eastern Baltic? Firstly, I'd like to stress the deliberate mixing of clay and amber in this context and propose that this mixing forms a new material which takes on some of the effect, effects of its ingredients. It's a mix of clay and amber, so let's call this new material clamber. So what effects might clay and amber be bringing to the clamber party? Superficially, the two materials appear diametrically opposed. The fluid plasticity of clay contrasting abruptly with the density and relative immutability of amber. Polished amber is translucent in all its forms. Um, uh, polished amber is translucent, clay in all its forms, opaque. Amber is often described as warm to touch, naturally occurring clay is cold. However, on closer consideration, some of these distinctions begin to blur. Both materials, when treated in certain ways, possess lustrous qualities. They partially reflect light and their surfaces can be smooth and slick to touch. Although the effect might take some significantly more time to achieve, amber can be endowed with continuously smooth surfaces in a fluid form, similar to that of clay. The binary distinction between translucence and opacity is also slightly more complex when we consider other ways in which these materials can act as transmitters. Whilst clay blocks the transmission of light, its extreme plasticity affords the ability to transmit form when applied to a firm shape or object. Covering something in a thin layer of clay might obscure the fine details, but its original shape is still broadly recognisable, if not pristinely replicated. Clamber therefore, therefore appears to hold properties of both transmission and transformation at its core. Although not universally practised, the repeated occurrence of amber rings in the area of these masks which correspond to the eyes of the deceased suggests an intention for interaction between the dead and the mask itself. Light is able to reach the eyes through amber, albeit in a diffracted and recoloured form. The shape of the deceased face is transmitted through the clay into the world beyond the mask, albeit having been somewhat distorted. In this way, the clamber mask acts as a lens between the deceased and the surrounding world, allowing the unidirectional transmission and transformation of both light and physical form. Let's think a little more about the context of these clamber masks. Given that they're being placed over the faces of dead people, I think it's fairly reasonable to assume that if these are about seeing between worlds, the worlds in question are that of the living and that of the dead. So if masks are lenses, we have the deceased behind the mask and the living in front of it. The clay effects allow the transmission of the form of the deceased face into the world of the living. This form is fixed to that of the individual in life, concealing the decay and decomposition processes which embody the transition from living to dead. The clamber effects allow light from the world of the living to pass through to the eyes of the deceased. As such, clamber masks allow the dead to see what's happening in the world of the living. It also allows them to continue to be in the world of the living through a representation of their physical living form. It's also worth noting that not everyone is buried in this way. Clamber masked individuals make up around 15% of the Middle Neolithic burials at Zenyeki and 10% of those from Pompara. You clearly don't need to be buried in one of these masks to transition from the world of the living to the world of the dead to die successfully. This is emphasised by the predominance of masked individuals within group burials. In these instances, you don't even need to be buried in a mass to successfully die at this particular time or in this particular, gra particular grave. 
What we are seeing here then is certain people being selected to play a specific role in death by wearing these masks. Clamber allows dead people to engage with the world of the living in particular ways, ways which allow them to perform the role of a conduit, an interloper, somebody who has died but who can still engage with both worlds and pass messages from one to the other. Let's step back a moment to think about this practice within the broader context of mid-Neolithic lifeways in the Eastern Baltic. The advent of the typical comeware in Finland is linked to a shift in attitudes towards clay and a huge increase in the quantities of figurines or non-vessel clay work on domestic sites at this time. This is accompanied by a shift in subterranean dwelling structures, incipient experiments in the addition of asbestos and organic materials to pottery temper, and hints within the paleo-environmental record of a steadily increasing role of horticulture and woodland clearings. Herver et al. argue that this marks an ontological renegotiation of the concept of earth, soil and land in the 4th millennium Cal BC, and that the increased non-functional working of clay on settlement sites represents a material expression of this renegotiation. They cite the literature on, um, on contemporary accounts of the haptic, meditative and mutualistic character of clay work, arguing that clay became a good material with which to think during the 4th millennium Cal BC. Ahola characterises unfired clay and fragments of pottery as key features of Finnish typical comeware funerary practices, suggesting that this thoughtful handiwork spilled across the realms of domestic and funerary practice. The application of clamber to the faces of the deceased further supports this and provides an example of a bodily engagement with clay within the context of a tripartite encounter between clay, living and dead bodies. The role of amber within hunter-gatherer societies of Finland was also undergoing a series of changes during the 4th millennium Cal BC. Amber artefacts begin to be found in larger quantities on typical comeware sites and at distances further away from the sources of the Baltic shoreline. Whilst evidence of the direct extraction of amber during the Stone Age is lacking, the assumption here is that this represents increased exchange and communication with, with groups who had access to the areas of the Baltic coastline upon which submerged outcrop of, outcrops of amber were frequently washed ashore by the tide. Within funerary contexts, amber appears to share an intimate relationship with slate. Amber artefacts are found deposited in similar areas of the grave to slate. And the use of both amber and slate to create rings is a feature of the typical comeware period in Finland. The deeper history of slate in the Eastern Baltic provides important context for this apparent equivalence. By the early 4th millennia Cal BC, high quality green slate from the Lake Onega region of Russia had been arriving in Finland for over a millennium. They appear with relative frequency within the Finnish Mesolithic and Neolithic burials, accounting for around 25% of the material culture recovered from such contexts. However, this proportion drops dramatically during the typical comeware to 1% of grave assemblages. In contrast, amber artifacts rise from being absent within the Mesolithic and Neolithic graves to accounting for 15% of material culture recovered from typical chromo graves. This marked shift in the choices of materials used suggests a change in the form of social interaction between the hunter-gatherer communities of the Eastern Baltic region during the fourth millennium, with certain artifact types, such as rings, repeated in the materials caught up within these relations. The choice, that, the choice to work amber effects into the death masking practices and material at, this, at the expense of slate materialises this broader change in inter-community interaction. In Northern Latvia, Meadows et al. also identify a Middle Neolithic shift in subsistence strategy, with saber isotope analysis of human remains suggesting a growth in the importance of freshwater aquatic protein within the mid-4th millennia Cal BC diets. These practices of claim masking therefore appear to emerge within the context of connected societies whose relationship with the land and earth is in flux, albeit in different ways. As such, it appears that clamber masking techniques developed during a period of social, economic and material dynamism. It also appears that during this time, both clay and amber had become material mediums for the expression of changing relationships between the people and materials which made up the Eastern Baltic world. As such, concepts of change in relation to social and human land relationships, and perhaps a degree of ontological anxiety, were woven into the materiality and meaning of clamber masking practices. The materialization of this particular form of interloper may have been a way for prehistoric communities to seek reassurances around the adoption of new practices within a rapidly changing world. Right then, to sum up and conclude on what I presented today, I hope I've demonstrated that the idea of masks in early um, European prehistory has surfaced on a number of occasions um, and that the previous arguments have suffered from a lack of attention to context. I've outlined the approach that our project is taking in terms of focusing specifically on the way faces are depicted and heads dressed, 
and that by better understanding these practices, we can make more robust arguments as to the presence or absence of masks within the archaeological record. The specifics of our understanding are still in development and potentially subject to change. So feedback, questions, discussion is really welcome at this stage. I hope what I've shown you has demonstrated that attitudes towards dressing the head and depicting the face are dynamic in early prehistoric Europe. There's no one single hunter-gatherer mode of practice that runs through these periods, and it very much looks like people in different places are doing different things at different times. More generally, I'd like to conclude by saying that the plan for this project has changed dramatically in the course of the last 18 months due to the implication of the COVID pandemic. Restrictions to travel and access to material have meant that we're doing, what we're doing now is not what we originally set out to do. However, I've shown you that there is scope for carrying out interesting research and generating new ideas, even in the current circumstances. Our funders have certainly been supportive of our change in approach, and I'm really excited about the findings that we're generating to date. Finally, I'd like to say a few really important thank yous. Um, Mari Torv, Liv Nelson Stutz, Brenna Hallgren, Sarah Gummonson, Haley Mickelberg, Amy Little, Andy Needham, and Harry Robson have all provided important conceptual sounding boards and support in tracking down relevant references. The Lever Hume Trust have been great in terms of funding us in the first instance and allowing us to change course as the project has unfolded. Finally, a uh, massive thanks to Chantelle, who's really a co author for this presentation. It's her project, and although the COVID teaching response has meant that she's not been able to be as involved in this as she would like to have been, it should be clear to you all from what I presented today that her thinking and logistic input has been the cornerstone of the whole project. So, on that note, I'll, I'll say thank you for your attention and uh, hand back over to Jen. Thank you very much, Ben. Oh, that's really, really interesting. And what a beautiful image there. Um, Lots to think about, uh, lots of reflections on COVID as well. Um, so we'd like to open it up to questions. Um, so Reggie, uh, do people normally type the questions to you? Um, oh, thank you, Kath. We have a question that's popped up. Already. Um, so I don't know if we can all see all of the questions. Let's see how this will work. Um, so do feel free to, to type in questions in the chat and then we'll, we'll go through them. I'll keep an eye and so, pick up on questions that we might have missed. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Kat's question here is um, differences in gender between who are given masks. Um, yeah, how, how would gender play out then? If there's um, no one else? So, so the, we, we've kind of steered away from, from tackling uh, questions of sex and gender for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, the, the the history of these sites that have been excavated at all sorts of different periods over the last 100 years and the preservation levels of human remains within these sites is really variable so it's very very difficult to get comparative data um, often you'll have assessments of sex which are carried out in the you know way back when sort of 50 50 60 years ago using methods that wouldn't be appropriate now wouldn't be kind of deemed kind of reliable or appropriate and other sites where the bone preservation is just so poor to it to allow those kind of assessments anyway um, there's also the, the kind of the theoretical bind of, of linking sex to gender in a kind of direct way, um, and that's something we're kind of reticent to do. So, so we've been a, a lot of the analysis of these um, cemeteries has been working with the kind of some of the lowest common denominators, so areas of data that we can compare, you know, realistically across multiple sites. And unfortunately, sex and gender was just something we didn't have a good enough consistent handle on to be able to say anything kind of meaningful. So we've sort of we sort of steered away from it a bit. Um, I know that's a bit. There, there may there may well be something fascinating there, um, and but we just we just can't we can't quite get get to grips with the data that we've got available currently. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I wonder, could you stop sharing your screen and then we can see you? Can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. There's a, there's uh, some other questions appearing here um uh question about masks used by children in play um that's an interesting question maybe to extend that for adults as well and and the way you can become a different person and the way you can hide i'm sure we've all you know because we, we're all reflecting on our own experience of wearing masks as well which i want to ask you about in a bit anyway sorry i'll stop talking over to you ben <laughs> um so children wearing masks well um again we're kind of we're kind of a bit like the a bit like the gender question. We're kind of hamstrung slightly in terms of the the, the bioarchaeological data that's available for the people in the cemeteries to get to really properly get to get to grips with the ages of the people that are being buried with mass the, in the Baltic cemeteries. Um, it's tricky. Uh, there's 
there's suggestions in some of the literature, um, particularly to do with the Paleolithic figurines. You know, but I show you that image of the Holmfeld's figurine who has the little peg um, where in her neck, and the, there's been lots of talk about whether that signifies a changeable head, um, and you know whether that's a, whether that's a toy, whether that's a, a, a toy that, that's been designed for children. Um, really, again, really difficult, and a lot of those kind of assumptions of miniaturized material culture being kind of children's toys are, are, are very heavily best based in kind of Western assumptions as to what children are, what childhood is, what toys are. Um, so you know, they're quite, it's quite hard to kind of pick through, pick through that. Um, in relation to the idea of, of, of masks being used in play, um, again, I think that's, that's something that the anthropological literature is really, really fascinating. Um, it provides some really fascinating alternative perspectives, you know, um, masks being something that we could play with that we could put over our faces uh, to represent a different identity um is one way of thinking about masks but in lots of societies around the world um that's not the case and masks are capable of affecting really powerful transformations and that's not the kind of thing you want your kid doing is turning themselves into a jaguar because <laughs> um, it could have terrible consequences for you and everyone around you and all the jaguars in the neighborhood as well so it, there's, there's kind of different attitudes towards masks and and understanding of what masks do and what masks create um, kind of can dictate the different ways in which they're kind of adopted in the different contexts in which they're used in society. So that idea of, of kind of universal children would always want to play with masks isn't necessarily isn't necessarily held up within the within the anthropological literature. Uh, one of my kids loves wearing a werewolf mask and I'm just reflecting on that slightly differently now. <laughs> so, uh, okay, thank you. So there's a question about um, with the interaction uh, between uh, the people of the East Baltic trading clay and slate be the precursor to the beaker people in the West? Yeah, so that is precursoring. So, so the slate stuff is is happening um, much much earlier. So we're we're talking about. I mean, the, the slate the, the slate the best evidence for the slate stuff comes from um, Oli Strovsky. So that's a that's a cemetery in in, in northern Russia, uh, and that's dated now been dated to around about five thousand two hundred Cal BC. So this is this is kind of millennia before the before the bigger people and that kind of that kind of big style of movement. But I think what's in yeah what's what's Interesting is that the, the movement of people around the Baltic is just is it's this constant melting pot. You know, it's it's just constantly swirling around, um, and obviously the the recent ADNA evidence is giving us kind of uh, a narrative about a very specific type of movement of people. But actually, you can see from the material culture, you know, for millennia prior to that, ideas are are, are swirling around, and that's probably associated with the. The movement of people as well because they don't move by themselves so um so yeah it's kind of uh, i think it provides a it provides an interesting perspective to the kind of the, the beaker stuff in the baltic um as a, as a kind of contrast but also a continuation of this much much broader theme within the prehistory of that region um, and tied to that was a question about ochre whether that was being transported um, or, uh, locally available yeah. So we think that's being locally sourced. Ochre, sourcing ochre is really difficult, um, uh, but it's something that seems to occur fairly uniform, occasionally, but uniformly distributed across the region. So there's 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 access to to ochre. There's there's also ochre is kind of a bit of a catch-all term that archaeologists use, and um, it's normally kind of implied to mean um, hematite. But actually, there's lots of different types of pigment um, and different kinds of of mineral deposits that can produce coloured pigments. Um, but unless material's been um, geochemically sampled and analysed, uh, working out exactly what it is is quite difficult. Um, but mineral pigments, red mineral pigments, um, are fairly widely distributed across the region, so there doesn't seem to be any kind of definite source for that stuff. That's some interesting questions about um, scientific methods that could be developed um, to, to track that. Um, okay, and what? So, let me see another question. Um, does the fact that not everybody was buried with a mask imply so social differentiation? Who got one? Mm, that's a good. Um, that's a good question, and I think uh, the approach that we've taken um, has has because the conventional way in which grave goods assemblages are interpreted is is always kind of through the through the lens of social differentiation and, and thinking about how material culture marks people out differently in their life. 
one of the things we want to do with this project is to think about how material culture can mark people out differently in death. So we've we've kind of we've slanted our slanted our thinking towards thinking to towards considering how a grave assemblage can make a, a dead person different. Um, and we've not necessarily extended that so much into into the considering their lives, which is perhaps inhibited us from getting into social differentiation um, to the extent that we might have done. But that that is kind of linked to the points earlier about age and gender and that bio archaeological data that that is difficult to get at. You know, if we wanted to build that argument as to as to social differentiation and these people having been different in life prior to death. Um, the avenues that we which we can pursue that are inhibited by the, the the patchiness of the of the organic preservation and also the 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 different the different ways in which the material has been studied and the data collected so it's um it's a good question and it's something that we're again that that kind of that approach to focusing on difference in death kind of came out of the character of the data set that we're working with, with really so it's it's a good question it's it's kind of it might it's possible but we we just struggled to find the data to really build a robust argument for that. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one last question here um, from Jane. Know, Jane, do you want to join in and actually ask? I don't know if you're um, you're around to be a, to be a host. Um, I can upgrade her, but it'll take me some clicking, so you'll have to wait oh, a okay. minute. <laughs> That's okay. I can just read it out. Um, Okay, it's, it's okay you ask it, says Jane, right? Um, so, uh, Professor Jane Downs asks um, about the, you've been talking a lot about the masks for the dead. So, is there um, an indication of the living wearing them or, or how do these differ uh, between like the, the deer headdresses that you've mm -hmm. looked at at Star Car, which seem to be for the living? Um, and of course, we're all thinking about masks for the living at the moment and how, how it affects how we, how we recognize people, um, how we move through the day, how you can, be anonymous in a way we couldn't two years ago. Thank you. Positives here of COVID. Um, so yeah, I was wondering about Jane's question there about uh, contrast between uh, masks for the dead and masks for the living. Yeah. So I think um, the evidence for masks for the living come from slightly different sources. So obviously, the burial record gives us some good good, good ideas about masks for, masks for the dead. Um, uh, it's kind of a clamber mask. I would struggle to see people wandering around with their faces plastered, plastered in clay and, and studying with amber. Um, but certainly, some of those things, you know, those coronias um, and the dyeing of the hair that we see in some of the in some of the grave features, like um, that may be, you know. The, that may be stuff that's going on in 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 in, in among, amongst the living as well as the dead. That's not necessarily a, a practice that's restricted to to burial context. How we get at that is really hard. You know, thinking about maybe use worth studies, which look at how used and worn bits of bits of those kind of grave assemblages are when they get deposited, might be a way to think about that. You know, that um that that bone pin from Grunnesby uh, that's that's pinning a woman's hair. Back there, that would be a really interesting, um, a really interesting potential use for a study if that's well preserved enough to think about how how worn it is and how how many hours that had spent in someone's hair uh, prior to going into the grave, the, the burial context. Um, but then, you know, other sources of data like the cave art, like as you say, the the red deer um, and the headdresses from the Baltic. There's this really cool um, kind of middle Mesolithic um, site that's been published very recently. Actually, site was published uh, during the course of the project. Um, with modified seal crania, um, and that's really really interesting because it's been kind of it's kind of it was kind of published as a as a kind of an extension of of uh, what's going on at Star Car and in northern Germany, but actually it's much much later and it's in the context of a very different ecology and a very different economy as well. So I think there may be some quite Baltic specific um, practices of, uh, of, of of headgear that that are, that are starting to emerge, um, and we'll be looking to work those. Those findings, um, I could really, I really want to go and look at them actually, because I think it's it's quite hard when you're looking at somebody else's analysis to work out what's comparable with the material you looked at or not. And so, it'd be cool, it'd be cool to get over um, to our uh, lab and get over to that and have a look at some of those. That'd be interesting. Um, yeah, be so, some interesting uh, parallels too with how seals are treated in the kind of myth and legend here with selkies, and the idea of the seal skins as well moving uh, moving around or. I can't quite remember the full details of the legend, but, um, but yeah, so looking at body parts of seals, <laughs> that would be really rather fascinating. Um, yeah, definitely. But we probably need to wrap this up because it's five o'clock now. Um, right, if anyone has any uh, detailed questions for Ben, um, I think he's going to get a web page up 
soon, probably through the UHI if one isn't available already. Um, Reggie, do you want to say anything about the next talk in this series or anything else to, to pull things together here? Thank you everybody for coming and huge thank you to Ben for an absolutely fascinating talk. There's lots of comments in the chat here to say thank you and this was great. Um, yes, we're going to continue this series. Next one will be on the 24th of September, which is the last Friday of September, but we have yet to confirm the speaker for that and then continue in the last Fridays of October, November. So. Um, we'll also post a recording on archaeology.orkney.com. <laughs>